Welcome to Cross Currents, produced by the City of Fort Collins in cooperation with the Larimer County League of Women Voters. I'm Barbara Retstein, the moderator for today's program. Our topic is, How Does Your Vote Count? The Future of the Electoral College. Our topic is a rather esoteric one because most people believe we vote for the presidential candidate who, whose name appears on the ballot. We do not. We actually vote for nine electors who represent the candidate and are pledged to vote for their candidate if he wins the popular vote in Colorado. We have nine electors because we have seven members in the House of Representatives plus two senators. This year, the electors will meet on December 19th in the governor's office to cast their votes. Each state can decide its own process within certain rules and constitutional requirements. The candidate who receives 270 electoral votes becomes the president. Why is this an issue? It makes it possible to have a president who actually did not receive the majority of the popular vote. This happened in 2000 when Vice President Gore had 500,000 more popular votes than George Bush, but George Bush won the Electoral College vote. It also confines the campaign to so-called swing states. On the other hand, the Electoral College system is part of the Constitution, and many are reluctant to change it. Furthermore, because there is a lack of uniformity in state election laws, many worry about unintended consequences of a truly popular vote. Before I in introduce our distinguished panel, we have a short video that humorously explains the issue perhaps better than I have. Hey there, excited to vote for president this November? Fantastic! Just one thing, you can't actually elect the president. You can vote, sure, but at the end of the day, it's not really up to you. See, way back before Twitter, CNN, and those things called newspapers, there was no way for presidential candidates to launch national campaigns. The Founding Fathers worried that giving the uninformed masses a direct vote could result in poor choices. They also thought letting Congress decide seemed less than ideal, so a compromise was reached. The Electoral College. I know, sounds like one of those degree programs advertised on daytime television. But the Electoral College is a group of 538 regular folks who actually pick the president. On election day, you're really voting for electors, these people who have pledged to back the winning candidate in your state. Each state gets the same number of electors as they have members of Congress, plus three for Washington, D.C. The candidate who gets 270 is a winner. So what ensures an elector will honor their pledge? Blood oath? Secret service? Actually, nothing. Some electors have even cast protest votes against the person they said they were gonna back. And a candidate can also win the popular vote nationwide but lose the electoral vote, as Al Gore found out the hard way in 2000. And what if neither candidate gets to 270? The election gets kicked to the House of Representatives and they choose. Why keep the system? Supporters claim it's the only way to ensure candidates pay attention to small states. And who doesn't like a good red and blue map on election night? Let us know what you think. Comment on the video, subscribe to our channel, send us a tweet, or log on to takepart.com slash Tuesday. Now let's get to our panel and our discussion. On my right is Robert Hoffert, Professor and Dean Emeritus of Colorado State University. On his right is Ellen Munez, Common Cause. On her right is Robert Hardaway, Professor of Law at the University of Denver St Sturm School of Law. And on his right is Pat Rosenteel, from Ansley Shea, a public affairs public relations firm in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Welcome to you and to our studio audience and to our viewing audience. Let's begin with a very basic question. Why is the choice, if it is a choice, between the Electoral College and a direct popular vote important to the American constitutional system? And we'll start first with the 
so-called experts on the Constitution. Bob Hoffert, first. Um, it's not false modesty, but um, I, I don't know how much of a, an expert I am. Uh, but I, I do pay attention uh, to the Constitution, and I do pay attention to the theoretical structure that uh, was embedded in the Constitution when it was founded. Contrary to the uh, little short subject, it wasn't primarily a problem of um, communications and, and that, that, that uh, dissuaded our founding fathers uh, to not just hand over the election to a direct vote. Um, it was actually that uh, they were in a bit of a bind. They were creating a system of self-governance uh, of the people in which at the same time they believed uh, that the people were the primary source of the problem uh, to protect what they most wanted to protect. They most wanted to protect liberty. And the greatest threat to liberty, says James Madison in Federalist Number 10, who was also the principal writer of the Constitution, is a majority. Uh, a majority uh, does not, e uh, in a democratic system, doesn't even uh, perceive its power, doesn't understand. Um, it's, it, it, it acts as though and it thinks and feels as though it's, it's, it's expressing its liberty, its freedom. Um, and so there had to be the, a system, a constitutional system, that created a balance between authorizing the will of the majority and moderating and constraining the unruliness of a majority. And the principal tactic that Madison proposes in Federalist Number 10 is twofold. One is, of course, uh, to create a national system rather than a state-based system for a, for a very important reason. He, he talked about it as extending the sphere. And he wanted to extend the sphere because he wanted to make the American people more diverse, more heterogeneous. Why? It would make it less likely that they would coalesce into a single majority, a single voice, that they would have multiple voices and multiple interests that would have to be negotiated. The second thing was to create a representative system in which not only did the people not rule directly in the sense that they ruled through representatives, but that the selection of, that no one, no official in the national government was a represented, a direct representative of the majority. The senators, the 100 senators of the United States Congress each represent, they are the representatives of a minority. The 435 representatives of the House are each a representative of a minority from their district. Each district is a minority of the whole. And the Electoral College also created a mechanism by which the majority could not act and assert itself directly. Um, oh, okay, let's go someone else now. Uh, Robert, what's your take on it? Do you agree, disagree? Well, uh, the when the Constitutional Convention was convened, a um, number of the smaller states were told by their states uh, that one thing we cannot tolerate is a change in the, in the Articles of Confederation which gave every state equal vote. And they said if anyone at that convention even mentions taking away one state, one vote, you are out of there. And sure enough, as soon as it was brought up the idea of having a national legislature um, which would be based on population, uh, they started to leave. And at the last minute, the compromise was reached, and it had two prongs. And this was the, co the compromise that brought the whole nation together. One was, we'll compromise. We'll have one house, the Senate, where we will, we will continue with the principle of the Articles Confederation, where every state has an equal voice. But we'll also have another house based purely on representation. Then the Electoral College was the second prong of that compromise that brought the nation together. Because the Electoral College is based on the number of representatives in the Senate and in the House of Representatives. 
Now, if people are really want to undermine this federalist system, which brought this nation together, the first step, as Ralph Nader has said, would be to abolish the U.S. Senate, because that's the first problem. Once you abolish the U.S. Senate, the Electoral College would naturally fall. One thing that I've always been kind of confused about or puzzled, why don't they go after the U.S. Senate? Uh, because if that's what they want to do, one person, one vote, get rid of the United States Senate. There was also a proposal to have a parliament based on the British model. And the reason that, that was rejected was because of the notion of separation of powers, that we don't want a president who's beholden to the legislature. So again, they compromised. They said, we're going to have a parliament, but it's going to have only one purpose, and that is to elect the president. And that's why um, in, in Great Britain, they have a parliament that also elects the president, but also passes legislation. We don't have that. Uh, the parliament actually acts as the British Electoral College. In 1974, the Labor, uh, the Labor Party did not get the most popular votes, uh, but they uh, did not get the most popular votes, but they still got the majority of the representatives uh, in Parliament, so they were able to form the government. But there were no appeals to the United Nations. This happens in our country. It happens approximately once every, two, or once every 100 years. It happened in 1876 happened in the year 2000. The purpose of the Electoral College was to ensure that any president had support not just in one narrow region, but in the whole country. For example, let's say in the 1950s, you had a segregationist candidate in the South who got 90% of the votes in the South and was able to eke out a popular vote victory, even though they are opposed by the other regions. The Electoral College assures that that can happen. You've got to have support everywhere. Okay. So it's the fundamental, it's, uh, just to close, okay. uh, the, the compromise that brought the country together is the Electoral College. And JFK, when some Republicans were trying to abolish the Electoral College, uh, it was actually JFK who said, it is not only the unit vote for the presidency we're talking about, but a whole solar system of government power. If it's proposed to change the balance of power in one of those elements, like the Electoral College, it's necessary to consider the others. In other words, what he was saying was, if you're going to change one of the prongs in our Constitution, the uh, compromise that brought it together, the Electoral College, then we should start from scratch, abolish the Senate, and just start from scratch. You can't just take one prong of the compromise that brought this country together and, and not look at the others. Okay, Pat. Well, I'm not, uh, I'm not here to um, abolish the United States Senate or destroy federalism. Um, both of our, um, our scholars forget to mention what the Constitution actually says, right? And the Constitution says in Article 2, Section 1, um, that a state shall appoint in the manner a legislature thereof will direct a number of electors. Um, I agree that the Electoral College was a compromise. I agree that the Electoral College is an important principle of federalism. I believe the definition of a federalism is where the power resides, not where it's actually used. And when it comes to the state-based plan, which is the National Popular Vote Plan, we preserve the state power under Article 2, Section 1 to award their electors in any uh, manner they deem is in the best interest of their state. Um, the founders couldn't agree on this. Hamilton wanted a king. Madison wanted more power in the hands of the people. When they compromised at that convention, they compromised around the Electoral College with Article 2, Section 1, which says we cannot agree on a method to dictate to the states on how they're going to award their electors, so we're going to remain moot on the issue, and we're going to leave the awarding of electoral votes to the body that is closest to the people, which is the state legislature, because they didn't want the Congress or the federal judiciary having a check on the federal magistrate. That would upset the balance of powers at the federal level, which is another important principle of the genius behind the founding documents of our, our country. So let's just um, you know, stick to the topic at hand, or at least the one that I want to talk about, which is national popular vote, the state-based plan, which allows Colorado to flex its power under Article 2, Section 1, to award her electors in a way that's different than she does so today. Uh, the way she does so today is through the winner-take-all rule that was never contemplated by the Founding Fathers, never endorsed by the Founding Fathers, and I'm pretty sure most of them would object to a system where 11 of the 13 original colonies are relegated to flyover status um, because they're either reliably Democrat or reliably Republican. The winner-take-all rule says that when a candidate wins one more vote in the state of Colorado, 
um, than the other candidate, he or she gets all of their electoral votes. What that results in is a system currently um, where two-thirds of the country is ignored. 32 voters of 32 states are not polled by their commander-in-chief. 98% of the political resources are spent in just 15 states and the rest of the country is treated as mere spectators. Okay, I think we'll get to some of those points later. Elena, would you like to add anything? Sure, well I think Pat did a good job of illustrating why it's so important that we have this conversation. I think the historical look back's important, but it's important to realize that we have changed the way that we allocate our electors over time. It wasn't always the case that the people had a vote to decide who the electors would be awarded to, or uh, I think that a direct election of U.S. Senate is another example where you can see that the shift from you know, controlling the, the masses to a more populist and direct democracy is something that our country has contemplated. And to me, the reason it's important for us to have this conversation is it because it does come down to how do we ensure that the people have a voice. And as Pat said, for many voters, even in Colorado, I mean, we're a swing state. We're at the top of the list of states that are going to get attention this fall. We'll see both candidates visit many, many times. Our ads are already bought up for the fall, newspapers, magazines, television, saturated with campaign ads. But if you vote for someone other than the winner, the ultimate winner of the popular vote here in Colorado, your voice isn't heard because all of the state's electoral votes will go to the winner. And that, I think, is an issue that crosses all party lines. It's not a partisan issue. You should have a voice, and when you go to the ballot box, have confidence that your vote is going to be heard and represented. And I think that's the shortcoming with the current system. It's not about the structure of the Electoral College, it's how we allocate those votes. And that's why something like national popular vote, which we support, is so important because it then gives everyone a voice, not just the majority within a particular state. Okay, well let's okay. go to another point. Um, because you talked about everyone having a voice. For example, in the current system, um, smaller states have really a lot more influence than larger states. For example, Wyoming has 500,000 people and three electoral votes. California has 70 times more people, but only uh, 55 votes, 18 times more uh, electoral votes. So is there a way to balance that out under either of your uh, scenarios? Well, if uh, I could just sure. quickly respond. And, and, um, if we had nas national popular vote, you take a state like Alaska, which has a very low population. Uh -huh. um, if, you, if it was had a national popular vote, no, no uh, presidential candidate would be interested in, in going up there because the, the population is so low. But as you pointed out, if they have three electoral votes, that's the compromise that brought this nation together. That's, that's a lot of votes. Uh, that's a lot of electoral votes compared to the population. So you'll see presidential candidates visiting some of those outlying uh, areas. This whole notion that, gee, uh, you're wasting your vote in Colorado if you think it's, it's going to go to a different party. You could make that argument with regard to the whole country. If you had national popular vote, you could look at the polls, 55% for one candidate, and say, well, my vote's wasted. You could, any minority could say, well, if we only got 44% of the vote, why should I vote? So that argument, <laughs> I, I don't see gets, that argument gets, at it gets, all. It gets, it gets to the first part of the discussion as well, though, which is why do states have their electors, right? States have their electors to maximize the influence of their state as it relates to providing a check on the president. If the current system were giving the small state advantage, I would probably reconsider my position. But you need to understand that 12 of the 13 states that have four or less electoral votes are either reliably red or reliably blue. All of them are flyover. Um, Alaska got zero resources in the 2008 election, 2004 election, and zero post-convention visits. The reason isn't because it's small or big. The reason it's b is because we know the Republican candidate's going to win it before we even know who the Republican nominee is. So my answer to your question is California with its 55 electoral votes and Wyoming with its four electoral votes have right. exact or three electoral votes. Idaho has four, my apologies. But Wyoming, with its three, have exactly the same amount of influence on electing of the President of the United States, which is zero influence other than the campaign cash they can export to the campaigns and, and sort of the national parties. Because they're so one way or the other, one exactly. party or the other, uh, red well, or blue. The, the current system is all about battleground states, those that are competitive in swing states, and flyover states. I mean, that's a political vernacular that's used by everybody from academia to the media to political consultants to campaigns. 
um, Mitt Romney's campaign talked about when they sewed up the primary, oh, that's okay, it's just an etch-a-sketch, right? Because we'll shake it clean because now we gotta run our campaign to the nine states that matter. That's the reality of the political system under winner take all. National popular vote is an alternative to that. The founders never gave the small states the three electoral votes so it would reflect the popular vote of their state. As a matter of fact, the only reason anybody in this room has the right to vote is because the legislature gave it to them for president. So the character of the fact. campaign that you describe is identical to whether you have an electoral college system with winner take all or whether you have a popular vote. This, the same exact reality is going to exist in terms of where the competitive states are and where the votes are. And the winner take all principle is not a principle that you should attribute to the Electoral College. It's a principle that you should attribute to the states because the states decide how they, they do the vote. And furthermore, it is a principle that we as Americans should um, understand we have bought almost universally. That is to say, we have decided that the winner of our elections is, is the, that entity that gets the plurality. Um, that is the, the dominant principle. There's only a few states that, that do anything different than a plurality vote. Um, why don't we, we talk why about those? Just, why don't we no, talk about the two states that do something different? I think it's Maine and Nebraska. Maine and Nebraska. Yeah, and, what do and, they do? And every other state could do exactly the same thing. California had the option. They rejected the option. They could have they could it's have not, allocated It's not a electoral. problem of the Electoral College. Electoral College doesn't determine that. It's, it's, it's our the state, state legislature it's our state, which makes this our state voting a perfectly laws. constitutional it's our state alternative. Voting laws. And if you don't like winner take no. all, as it now is constituted with the Electoral College, my goodness gracious, the, the National Popular Vote Compact uh, is one that, that takes that even to a more uh, extraordinary extent. Because then what it does is it says to the, the states that constitute the 270 votes, you are going to vote for, you're going to give all of your votes, winner take all, mm -hmm. to the candidate that your state may not have even voted for. But every vote but in that I state. I think oh, it vote. makes a slight difference. I mean, you have to think for a second that when we're talking about the majority vote, we're talking about the majority of the country, the national popular vote. So it's no longer a case where in Colorado, the person who has one more vote than the other they get all of the electoral votes. You look at the entire map, and suddenly candidates have an incentive to come into states that aren't battleground states and try to talk to those voters who might support them. And so you then look at the, the vote totals over the entire country. So I think that's a big difference, because then the majority vote actually reflects the majority, the popular vote. This flyer of a theory, under that theory, uh, if the polls show that one party has 55%, 45%, they fly over the whole country, because they say our vote won't count. So that, that argument doesn't... Well, I don't uh, understand doesn't, doesn't, about <laughs> votes counting or not uh, counting, but I think it's about everyone in the country having a voice and having an opportunity to participate in the But if Alaska the has three electoral votes, they'll get a visit. If they just are, if, if it's a national popular vote, they, they will didn't, They didn't get a visit. But they don't. Uh, the call any of your legislative well, friends. Wait, don't all talk at once, because yeah. then we can't hear. One at they a time. Cer <laughs> they certainly aren't going to uh, be visited based on their population. Now, well, that we know for sure. Well, well, why do you say that? I mean, are you thinking that all the campaigning is going to be done in sort of these big major metropolitan exactly. areas or something like that? Well, yeah, That's okay. exactly so, what would happen. Uh, That's uh, where the votes in, are. In my home state of Minnesota, where we, we elect governors on a statewide basis, they don't get electors per county, right? They get whoever wins the most votes wins. In my home state of Minnesota, my governor, Tim Pawlenty, was elected and re-elected to the governorship without winning Minneapolis, St. Paul, Duluth, Mankato, or Rochester. Those are the five largest cities. And how did he win his campaign? He won his campaign by aggressively campaigning to rural, exurban, and suburban areas that aren't the big cities in Minneapolis. Now, when you add up the political voting population of the top 50 cities, it's 19% of the vote. I'm not sure that I can convince a single candidate to ignore 80% of the population and the voting population when they're running for president. So I'm sure there are similar examples in Colorado where they just don't you know, set up shop in Denver and pretend that's all they have to do to, to win a governor's seat or, or, or a U.S. Senate seat here in Colorado. Right now, those states are being ignored. 
220 million Americans live in flyover status. They will receive zero visits, they will receive zero campaign, their voter turnout in those states will be seven points lower than they will be in the swing states. And in order to oppose sort of a change, a constitutional change, you have to own this current system which says it's okay for sitting presidents not to poll 32 states out of 50 so they can figure out how to win their reelection campaigns. Okay, and if you've only Robert? Got, if you've only got uh, four months to campaign, it's one thing in a, in a driving area within one state. If you have a presidential candidate that has four months and can only go to so many places, he's gonna go where the, where, where the bucks are. He's gonna go where the heads are. He's gonna go to the major population areas. He's not gonna go to 62,000 rural hamlets. He's gonna go to New York City. He's gonna go to Los Angeles. He's gonna go where he can get the most bang for the buck. So that argument, uh, to me, and he's going to do that whether fully it's an electoral sense. college system yes. or a national popular Look, vote. Yes. Right, but that's, right now, that's a red minute, herring. Elena. Well, I was going to say. I mean, right now they're going to six states, and we happen to be in one of them right now. And maybe that'll hold on for you know a few more cycles. Maybe not. But those six states get the vast majority of their money, the vast majority of their time. The only time they go to reliably red or blue states is to do fundraisers to then fund the campaigns they're waging in those handful of states. So yes, I think there's a disconnect right now and the entire country is not part of even the issues that are being discussed. The campaigns are being centered around issues that appeal, according to focus groups, polling, et cetera, to those voters in six states. Now, does that mean every voter in every single state would get a visit under a na national popular vote plan? Probably not. But it does mean that more states would come into play, more communities would come into play, and people would have a real incentive to feel like their voice mattered whether or not they were in a reliably red or blue and, state. And they won't be, and they won't be, um, a f they, they won't be forcefully excluded from the system. I mean, they will get direct mail, they will get get out the vote money, they will get party building resources. Um, you know, if Los Angeles was going to control a campaign, you'd think it'd be able to control the gubernatorial campaign in the state of California. Um, Duke Magian, Wilson, um, Schwarzenegger, um, they were elected routinely statewide in the state of California and they never came close to carrying Los Angeles, Sacramento, um, you know, Fresno, Bakersfield, Modesto, the big cities in California. I understand it was the first thought I had, but when you do the political uh, demography, when you actually do the research and do the analysis and you understand it, it's a red herring and it's not true. Okay, Robert, but, I see you have something to say. <laughs> <laughs> if you think that a presidential candidate is going to go to Podunk where there's 17 votes rather than Los Angeles, New York, then you're, you're persuaded by this argument, but perhaps we should move on. Uh, okay. I don't, I don't, well, I don't know that he will, but his wife I, I might, his want, kids want might, his surrogates thing. might, or her surrogates might, and they don't currently under the current system because every one of those votes in Podunk, maybe it's Fargo or Bismarck or Greeley, you know, whatever, whatever it is, whatever those small towns are, they will have surrogates, they will have forceful advocates on the ground fighting for every vote because every vote matters in every state and every presidential election. Um, and I can guarantee, well, personally, I, I believe that to be true. Okay, Bob. I think that the discussion related to the Electoral College often gets uh, has to carry baggage that is not related to the Electoral College. The, the winner-take-all issue is not an Electoral College issue. It's a state legislature and it's a voting law in the United States issue because we are committed to giving winners to pluralities, not majorities. The other, the other thing of, of, of competitive elections, the competitive states is not an Electoral College problem. The, the issue of, of competitive states and non-competitive states and the patterns that that creates for campaigns is going to be the exact same thing for a popular vote as it is for a system that uses the Electoral College. I would agree that winner take all is not an electoral college thing other than that's the way that 48 states choose, well, then have chosen to award their electors to, today. You, you want that the state nine, compound. Nine wait, wait, changed, one at a time. That nine have changed. But if, 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 if winner take all is not an electoral college issue, then neither is national popular vote. National popular vote is not an electoral college issue because it preserves the electoral college and it gives legislators an option to make themselves and their constituents more relevant to the president of the United States, which is exactly why the states have the power. Um, but it, but it, has but, but it preserves that. the electoral college. Just wait a minute. Okay. It, Say what it, preserves, it preserves the electoral college by violating Article 1, Section 10 of the Constitution. How does it violate Article 1, Section 10? It, it, Article You're 1, Section 10. You're talking about the compact? The clause? compact okay. provision. How does, it, how does it violate that? 
well, states are not, states are not authorized to make compacts with each other. And the Supreme Court has, has ruled in favor of that with the, as long, with one exception. And the exception is if the compact that they create has no negative effect on non-compacting members. Well, this clearly has, an, uh, has negative implications for non-compacting states, members. States are, uh, states are allowed to enter compacts provided they receive congressional consent. Regarding this has got no congressional. This has no congressional. It's congressional. It's not even I, I, part of the process. A couple of constitutional lawyers. I got a quick question for you. Okay, well, congressional consent is um, required as a precondition to considering a compact. How many compacts in the history of our country, which number in the thousands, have had the consent of Congress before they've reached their enactment clause? Where is where is the? I, I read the That's, I read the provision. Where is there anywhere in the proposal? You have all kinds of things about implementation. Where is there anything about consulting Congress? As an interstate compact, compacts require congressional consent unless it is based on a plenary power of the state and does not impinge on federal, um, fe uh, purely federal issue. That's what the Rehnquist Court says. But yeah. m every compact doesn't mention congressional consent. Compacts are required to get congressional consent. Uh, the, the critical case in that is United States Steel, in which thir uh, a number of states got together in a tax commission. And they, they went to Congress. Congress would not give their consent, but they went ahead and did it anyway. And what, co and what the Supreme Court said was, you can have a compact on things like water rights, like a state like Arizona and California can agree on how to split their water. If it doesn't do something that infringes upon the national scheme of something, or infringe upon the rights of, of, of parties who are not members of the conspiracy. Here we have uh, the, the idea as few as 13 states can enter into a conspiracy, that is an agreement, to basically cut out all the other states. And the question is, what, what about the other states that are not members of this conspiracy, who would want no part of it? If their candidate would have won the election, except for these 13 states conspiring, to say that that has nothing to do with the 14th Amendment, to say it has nothing to do with the Compact Clause of the Constitution, I mean, this is litigation for the foreseeable future. Well, it if certainly like has this. to do with the Compact <laughs> Clause of the Constitution, but we intend to get congressional consent. Why don't you well, do that and first? that's not a, that's not a, but because it's a plenary power of the state to determine how to award these electors and we believe that the states as rational actors and as the sovereign will of the people in the closest body of the people get to determine whether or not this is in their best interest. It's a plenary exclusive power under Article 2, Section 1, and as a strict constructionist, I think you'd applaud our approach. Okay, well, I have a question for you. How do Maine and Nebraska allocate their electoral votes? In, in Nebraska by district. By congressional district. And what about the two senators? The they are at large? Are, the at large are awarded to the candidate who wins the most votes in the state of Nebraska. Okay, and what about Maine? Same. Okay. So if you win the congressional, if you win the congressional district, you get one electoral vote. The two at large are awarded to the candidate who wins the plurality vote of the state. And Colorado considered doing that and rejected it uh, uh, overwhelmingly. And so did why, California. Why did they do that? It. Well, because because let, let's say look at California. They have 50, 54 or some electoral votes. Uh, it would be split uh, based on proportion. Uh, probably 26, 22, perhaps in the next election. So that means their net contribution to the Electoral College would be four. And California isn't about to do that. And, and we, too, oppose the congressional district system, meaning national popular vote, because we believe it takes a bad system and makes it worse. Right now, the voters in the I-4 corridor of Florida have all the power because they're swing voters in a swing state. Uh, under a congressional district system, there are probably about um, anywhere between 40 and 60 competitive congressional districts around the country that then would receive all the power, all the attention, all the visits, all the polling, um, all the policy promises that are important to their people. So it takes a bad system and makes it worse. I should just add also that if you have a conspiracy of 13 states that cut out the other states, um, th those states are, will not be bound by any uh, rules concerning recounts. They're going to be bound by their own state rules. So that if the COSA conspiracy, the members of the COSA conspiracy say, this is our, we, we want to, we, we're going to cast our votes for, say, o Obama. Cool. And, the other, and the other states say, uh, uh, but it's a very close election, let's say. Well, who is what the is COSA? A, what, yeah, what is the COSA conspiracy what is and who COSA is the COSA conspiracy? is an agreement. If you look in the dictionary, conspiracy is defined as an agreement. You can call okay. it a compact, you so can call it an agreement, or you can call it conspiracy. Why don't you That's call it the national well, popular right, vote? But it all, I mean, let's be clear, the 13 states that would be involved in this so-called conspiracy would be a mix of red and blue states who are not conspiring in the 
colloquial term, to try to steal the election. And so the idea that you'd have those 13 states coming together, I think, is highly unlikely. Well, they're, they're, they're just violating the Wait a minute, the one at a time. The, 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 repre the, the representation that this is uh, a, a all John Cosa is, is sort of silly. I mean, this is a... This is a national movement of Republicans, Democrats, and independents. Um, I guess John Coza um, wrote the proposal and has been a huge supporter of what we're trying to do here, but so has like an uh, anti-Buffett rule, pro-life Republican out of Florida oh, no, named Tom Golisano. We don't but, need but, to. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's Republicans, Democrats, independents, legislators across the country who believe there's a better way for their states to exercise their plenary power. It's not a scheme and they're not duped. Okay, Elena, you were talking. <laughs> well, I, again, I just think it's important when we talk about this conspiracy that you know could be going on, we're talking about a national discussion about how to make sure everyone's voices count. And that's why there is bipartisan support. And so the 13 states that in theory could decide to enter into this compact together and steal the election, uh, that's not gonna happen for two reasons. One, those 13 states don't really agree. So I don't think we're gonna see them come together unless we see a much broader coalition in support of this, this kind of compact. But then two, again, we're talking about making sure that the voices of the entire country count. And that's the, the theory behind the national popular vote system. You wouldn't allocate the electoral college votes unless the, it was going to the winner of the entire national popular vote. So those 13 states couldn't decide to come up with their own theory about who should win. It would be based on the votes of every American who chose to vote in that election. And that's what this is about. It's about returning the election so that it's not just the voters in six states who decide who becomes president, but voters throughout the country. And so as much as I think this you know, conversation about you know, kind of the scary, perhaps, you know, intentions or undertones, you know, it's kind of an interesting topic, but I think it drives us away from the real point, which is this is about making sure people have their voices heard, and I think that's where we really should focus our debate. Now, I think it's just the opposite, though, because under this national popular vote, there's no provision for either a recount. There's no provision even for a runoff. So if you have sp split parties like Perot uh, some years ago, uh, a party with 20% or 10%, even countries like France, even banana republics have a runoff. There's no provision for a runoff runoff under this, under this conspiracy and scheme. There's no, there's, there's, there's no provision for runoffs in any of the states based on their current winner-take-all rules. I mean, it, we've, we elect plurality presidents routinely under the current system, including Lincoln and, 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 and Nixon and, 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 and Bush and Clinton twice. I mean, we elect plurality presidents. That's the point of, um, of Professor Hofford. Um, how would you the, have a recount? The, the candidate, how would you have a recount? You would have ever, all 50 states control their own recount processes right. and they have a recount. Now the truth is, is Congress is authorized to establish a national recount process if you were concerned about it. But under national popular vote, you know, recounts would be highly unlikely. I mean, it, it, the average recount, one out of every 160 statewide races are recounted. Okay, the average votes that change hands in a statewide recount are 296. There isn't a single election for president since the start of our republic that would have needed to be recounted if it was based on a national popular vote total. Not 1916. Um, uh, I don't think so. It was 300,000 votes. It was so close. It was so close that it definitely would have triggered a recount. No, the it was reason it was going to trigger a rec recount is because it was 50 separate elections. It almost did trigger recounts in South Carolina and Illinois, but Nixon rejected the need to recount Illinois because he kind of knew what was going on down in South Carolina. So the only reason they talked about recounting that election is the same reason they recounted Florida in 2000 in a not particularly close presidential election. It's because it came down to 249 or 529 hanging chads in Broward County, Florida, and the entire the entire country was held hostage to the integrity of that recounting process in Florida. The Electoral College isolated in that one instance where you had a close electoral count, which happens maybe once a century or so, isolated it to one state. Under a national popular vote, if you have a close election like in 1960, you wouldn't have a recount in one state. You'd have a recount in 50 states, 62,000 hamlets. We would not know who the president was in 1960 if we had had the MPV. We still wouldn't know it was that close. And every time you count 50 or 60 million votes, you're going to get a different total. This is what happened in Mexico six years ago. They had this national popular vote scheme. And it was so close, they realized that they have a recount. It's just, it's just going to be a different number. You can't get the exact number. So consider the trauma that we had in Florida in 2000 and multiply it by a factor of 50. 50 lawsuits, 50 pieces of litigation instead of just one. That's what the MPV but okay, well, correct. let's change the and subject. Then, well, but then, no, that's too important. That's not quite correct. 
I mean, this doesn't change the fact that 50 states run 50 elections, and so it would only be if there were a recount required in any particular state. That's like saying under the current electoral college system, if one state had a recount, all of the other states would also have a recount. So I, I think that's incorrect to say that we would see 50 states having simultaneous recounts. How would it work? Wait a minute. Let him answer. If you had a very close popular vote election, the 13 states and that were members of the conspiracy would have recounts because they'd probably agree to that. But what about the other states who say, we, we don't have a close vote in our state? How are you going to force them to have a recount? Well, every state allows candidates and parties to pay for their own recounts, and I'm guessing the political parties that are involved are going to figure out a way to do that. But the idea that we wouldn't have a president from 1960 ignores the fact that there's a safe harbor clause right, that says we have a result on election night, which means election results get certified, and that states have a reasonable period of time to conduct their state counts in um, the current system and under national popular vote. So there would be a winner. We would be swearing in a president because the safe harbor clause uh, m mandates that an election result gets certified seven days before um, Congress counts. Okay, let's get on to the idea of these red, blue, and purple states. That wasn't always the case. Why is it now? Has the media just done it, or computers have made you know, it changes. Polling? It changes from time to time. The notion that we should devise a system, undermine the whole system of federalism, because today certain states have uh, a majority of, of red or blue, uh, is a very bad way to make constitutional policy. I, I think it's always been that way, to be the, to be honest with you. I mean, everybody talks about this winner-take-all rule like it was the uh, the idea of the founders and, and, and the system we already always had. I mean, 10 of the first 13 states used a different method, right? Legislators, legislatures appointed electors or governors appointed electors. The reason we moved to this system was because Virginia moved to this system. When the Reds were um, the Jeffersonian Republicans and the Blues were the the Federalists. Um, Madison and Jefferson didn't like the idea that John Adams could bargain for Southern electors to make John Adams the second president of the United States. And so Madison, who's a political genius and understands how to manipulate systems to get his result, I mean, he's brilliant at it, probably the best political operative in the history of the world, as well as political philosopher, said, we're going to move to the unit rule because they're not going to get Virginia's electors away from us and we're going to appoint a slate of electors that go are elected by the popular will of white landed men at that time let's just get that out there but that's how we moved to this unit rule this winner take all rule the southern states responded with virginia either by appointment or if they went to the popular election by state they went to the union rule so the north could not pick their electors in the north responded in kind. That's how we've ended up with the system we had today. When Colorado joined the, um, joined the Union, um, it politically, economically, and culturally was aligned with the North. And they went to the unit rule, just like everybody else was at that point in time. But that, the Commonwealth of Massachusetts had 13 different methods of doing this. Okay. No state is required to have the unit vote. I think we've established no. that. Uh -huh. and, two, and two don't. And two don't. Okay, but how? So that's a red herring completely. Okay, well, how can we get to a national campaign instead of a red and blue campaign? Is that not possible? Well, I would argue it's possible with national popular vote. If you make the popular vote of the entire country matter, you then create an opportunity for the entire country to be part of that dialogue. I would argue just the opposite, that, that small states that have three electoral votes, which is more than they would be entitled to on our popular, top popular vote system, uh, that was the prong that brought this whole country together. And like JFK said, if you're going to change one, if you're going to change the Electoral College, the one prong that brought this country together, you've got you to start from scratch. You've got to consider abolishing the Senate. But if you have three electoral votes, which is more than would be, they'd be entitled to in their population, they're going to get more attention uh, than they would if they were, if it was based purely on their population. So the Electoral College at least uh, what it gives an incentive to visit small states, which the which an MPV but would an not do. But an incentive that they don't take advantage of. Let Bob talk. Mm -hmm. Independent ahead. of whether we have a popular vote or electoral college vote, I think we, we ought to get a pinch of reality here about our, our campaigns. We don't have campaigns that are concentrated even on pressing issues of a select number of states. We don't have campaigns that are focused on national issues, international issues, or, as I said, uh, a subset of, of state issues. We have campaigns that are primarily based on how money can manipulate issues and people. 
And that's not going to be any different whether we have the compact or the electoral college. That's the reality of where we are. As, as far as what I see. Well, and I do uh, agree with that, that I mean, really, that's a whole other panel, which would be the influence exactly. that money plays on our political process. But in the meantime, are there other things we can do in terms of the structure of how votes are allocated? I think that's where national popular vote has a real opportunity to really just change the way we have conversations in this country. And I should add, yeah. MPV, MPV is not new. Alexander Hamilton suggested that we completely eliminate states, that we face, if states aren't a factor. He said, just let's, let's just draw arbitrary lines and have a national type of situation with a government. That was rejected and I think it's the genius of our system. Federalism is the genius of our system. And to undermine that, Federalism and, is where JF, the power JF, lies. and JFK was understood that and that's why he defeated the, re, the, the rampant Republicans that were trying to undermine or circumvent the Electoral College back in the 1950s. But okay, to be fair, we also didn't have direct election of U.S. Senators, which I think we all agree is now probably a good um, evolution or giving yeah. women the vote. I mean, we've evolved quite a bit since, you know, we came up with the original ruling structure and I think that we have to be open to ways to improve that further and national popular vote doesn't destroy the Electoral College. It just gives states another way to allocate their votes. There's one thing that the direct election... Wait a minute. Let Bob talk. The direct election of senators um, did not change one of the fundamental things about the original constitutional design. And that is whether the senators are elected directly by a popular vote or whether they're elected by state legislatures, in either case, every senator represents a minority of the American people. No senator represents a national majority. That's the difference in terms of the implications for the, the presidency. Well, I, also, I, ahead, I, I, do, I do want to say that I, I think the issue about the red states and the blue states is, is primarily an issue of competitive states and non-competitive states. And I, I think that, um, that, that, that beneath it, that's the primary issue. And the particular way in which we elect presidents, that is, whether by a popular vote or through electoral college system, is not going to change the fact that some states are significantly non-competitive Republican states, some states are significantly non-competitive Democratic states, and some states are somewhat more competitive states. Mm -hmm. And the campaigns in either system are going to be focused on the competitive states, the states that are up for grabs. Mm -hmm. They're going, to be, they're going to be focused on turning out every vote they can possibly turn out, just like every other statewide race that's run right now, which means they're going to be focused in every state. Now, I, I, oh, wait I a minute. I want to see if there's any questions in the audience before the hour runs away. Any questions there? Yes. Wait, wait a minute. You need to have a microphone. Hold on one second. If you identify yourself and then ask a particular panelist, and then I'll let all of them answer, or you can just direct it to the whole panel. To the panel. My name is Ed Burke, and I live in Windsor. My issue is, how could we, or how could the American people uh, change this whole process we have and get into a popular vote versus this intermediary vote of an electoral college, which is an, an old way of doing business? So how, how, can it be, how does it change? The Constitution would have to change, that have to be an, an amendment to the Constitution, as I, as I would think. So it would be just a constitutional amendment that can change the entire system. If, if your interest was in abolishing the Electoral College, it would require a constitutional amendment. Now, the founders gave an, a sufficiently broad article in Article 2, Section 1, that allows for a compact like this to go to a national popular vote without amending the Constitution. But if you, wanted to, if you wanted to eliminate or abolish the Electoral College, it would require a constitutional amendment. It's, it's not entirely true that... It would be permanent. It's not entirely true that states are absolutely free to allocate their electoral votes any way they want to. They are restricted by the 14th Amendment and a number of other amendments. They are particularly restricted by the Compact Clause. And if they want to... Uh, if, I, I've talked to some of the COSA uh, people, and uh, some of them have confided to me that we, we're trying to push towards a constitutional amendment. We know this is un unworkable. When I testified before the Colorado legislature, they were 10 to 1, they said, this MPV sounds great. Once we explained the problems with it, that there's no way to recount, there's no runoff, there's no nothing, it reversed 10 to 1 the other way. They realized what a monstrosity it was. But could but, the recount uh, be part of the amendment? Oh, yes. 
So in other that words, would, that a lot of the COSA that. people will admit, I don't know if, if you're going to admit this, but they say, we know this is a monstrosity, but it's a way to get good things going towards an amendment. That if we have an election like in 1960, where we have to have 62,000 recounts uh, in, in, in all 50 states, and it's, a, and it's a travesty, then maybe people will say, well, let's have an amendment. And so some of them concede that, that we don't, we know this isn't workable, but it's our way to push towards an amendment. If there's that much support for eliminating, the, for undermining federalism, for, for under, uh, undermining the compromise that brought this country together. If there really is that much support, how come they can't get an amendment in the Congress? It's been done many, many times. The people are That's not the way they should do it. I, okay, Elena? I personally think the people are not that aware of this whole issue. Okay, Elena, do you have a response to him? Well, I guess just two thoughts. First, I would take an exception again to the secret confidants of the COSA conspiracists or whatever they are. Um, as Common Cause, you know, we are a nonpartisan organization working for open and accountable government. We support national popular vote because we think that the majority of the electorate should decide who the winner is, and it's as simple as that. Obviously, we could do that through national popular vote, which allows for the interstate compact, or it could be a constitutional amendment. I think that there are multiple options, and it's just a question of whether or not the Electoral College needs to be abolished or just more accurately reflect current times. Um, and I just think Okay, it's Bob? I have a proposal, um, and my proposal is a new amendment to the Constitution that really doesn't speak directly to either a popular vote or an Electoral College. It simply is a, it's an amendment that says that the selection of all presidential electors, senators, and House representatives shall be determined by a majority of those citizens who vote in each state and or district election. Each state legislature is authorized to determine runoff procedures, if ne necessary, consistent with due process of law and equal protection of the law. And I think that that would, um, in many, many different ways, have a significant uh, impact on, uh, on changing our, our system. Of the 715 proposals to undermine federalism since the founding of our republic, that, that's actually been one of them. And it was considered by a presidential commission some years ago, and I, I've, got, uh, I've got a whole history of that, so I'm, f I'm familiar with that. And that is one of the reform proposals that's out there. Okay. I, I, just, I, I, I just have a quick question. I'm, I'm still, and maybe you can, we can talk about this offline too, but I'm still trying to figure out how states flexing the exclusive power awarded to them under the Constitution is undermining the concept of federalism. And I, you know, I studied political science for a long time and sort of con law over at the University of Minnesota, and that is a unique definition of federalism you have. So I'm, I'm interested in hearing more about that. Well, the JFK, I think, said it, said it best. The grand compromise was what brought this country together. The small states were, willing, were, were going to walk out. And this two-pronged compromise is what brought the country together. And by to trying to circumvent this, the whole purpose of the Electoral College was to ensure that support for the president was broad as well as deep. You don't have 90% mm -hmm. of the people in the South voting for a segregationist candidate, barely eking out a popular vote victory when the rest of the country is against it. Why did, they didn't like that idea. Why did the and state so that's why they have these two prongs in our Constitution. And the compact clause is a restriction on states doing this kind of thing. So to say that states can do anything they want, they can have a lottery to determine electoral votes, it's not true. They can't violate the 14th Amendment and they cannot violate the compact clause, which says they cannot conspire, agree, or enter into a compact unless Congress agrees. And I can tell you almost absolutely that members of Congress and the members of the Colorado legislature said we would never agree to something Why like that. Why did the state okay. of Delaware lead several small states suing the state of New York over their winner-take-all rule because they believe it unfairly impacted them? Well, the... Uh, and was that an exercise of federalism? I'm curious. Well, I think Vernon Jordan, who was the... Uh, uh, head of the uh, National Urban League said at best when he said that the, any, any playing around with the Electoral College uh, would, would be a restriction on, on, on voters' rights. Take away the Electoral College and the importance of being a minority or black melts away. Mm. Blacks, instead of being crucial to victory in major states, simply become 10% of the total electorate with reduced impact. Why they does the NAACP they know, they endorse know, national popular the, vote? That's why the Arizona Civil Liberties Union totally rejected this. They, they would okay. consider an amendment, but they say this is a monstrosity. Okay, I'm going to let you make one comment. And because we're at the end of our hour, we'll just go down the line. And my question to you is, if you think we could improve the current system, tell us what it is. And if you think there is no need to improve it, then just 
tell us that too and make it quick because we have I, five well, minutes. I, I clearly think national popular vote is the way to constitutionally improve the current system. Um, you know, every state was given this right to maximize their influence. I think the current system of winner take all rules um, marginalizes 200 million Americans. I think American presidents poll just 32 states, um, you know, 18 months before their reelection campaign. I think the current system manipulates public policy in a way that benefits battleground states versus the rest of the country. And I actually believe that the candidate who wins the most votes, not necessarily the majority, but the candidate who wins the most votes ought to be the President of the United States. Okay. Um, Go ahead, Robert. Well, the Electoral College has, uh, has given us a very stable government over 200 years. It's become the envy of the world. You only have to look at some of the banana republics, uh, some of the other countries that have this supposed MPV and see the problems that exist. The Colorado legislature recognized that this kind of solution is, is absolutely a monstrosity. If people really want to undermine uh, federalism, then they should do it the way JFK said. Let's start from scratch. Eliminate the states, eliminate the Senate, and then we can eliminate the Electoral College. So if that's what we want, we should do it from scratch, but not just take one little piece out of the grand compromise that brought this country together and made us the envy of the world. Okay, Elena. I think this fall we're gonna see the classic case for why we need reform. As Colorado, we're gonna see a lot of ads, we're gonna see a lot of attention, and we should talk to our friends and neighbors in other states and see how much attention they're getting if they're not in a swing state. And to me, it's about making sure that everyone does have a voice and that the winner of the election actually reflects the preference of a majority of citizens who vote in the election. And that's why I think national popular vote is an important improvement on our current electoral college system because it really does allow us to have the winner reflect the majority or a plurality uh, of the voters who participate. And I think that there have been you know, a lot of concerns that I think are a bit overblown. And if we really boil it down, it comes down to can people have their voices heard whether or not their state's purple. And under the current system, it's not. And I think that's why national popular vote's important. Okay, Bob. I think national popular vote is legally uh, questionable. I think it's ethically troubling. And I think it's philosophically dangerous. Um, and it's the latter that I want to make one last brief comment about. It's dangerous because I really believe that Madison was very wise in, in his um, authorization of the power of the majority, but in his recognition that the majority often can be the greatest danger to our liberty. And I believe that something that moderates that direct imposition of majority will and the recklessness that it can create in an immediate situation is wise. Okay, thank you to our panelists for a very lively discussion. It was most enjoyable and I learned a lot. Uh, thank you to our studio audience and to our viewing audience. This Cross Currents program will be rebroadcast at various times during the month on Channel 14 in Fort Collins. Please consult local listings for the exact dates and times. Copies of recent Cross Currents programs are available for checkout from the Poudre River Library District at 201 Peterson Street and the branch at Front Range Community College at Shields and Harmony Road. The video is also available at the League of Women Voters website, which is www.lwv-larimercounty.org. Thank you so much. That was spirited. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.